like log into my own Zoom. I, it, whatever is on this thing, which is my interactive tablet, also shows up on that screen and the far one over there. But I can make it go on all four, which is or all three, which was actually kind of dumb. But here, um, so this red dot is on the west coast of Florida. This is the Tampa Bay, uh, Tampa St. Pete area. So people call it Tampa St. Pete because St. Petersburg is up here and Tampa is down here in Bradenton. So the location of this thing in the story are these ponds right here. These uh, holding ponds are retention ponds from the uh, from a fertilizer factory that operated for a long time, but has since closed. And this is the Tampa Bay itself. So th uh, this is the open ocean right here. All right, so let me play this story so you can see like, what's going on. Officials in Florida are scrambling to avoid an environmental disaster amid fears over possible flooding of contaminated water in the Tampa Bay area. A reservoir pond at an old phosphate plant is threatening to overflow into neighboring communities and potentially into the Gulf. Hundreds of homes have been forced to evacuate as officials try to prevent millions of gallons of wastewater from spilling into nearby areas. Kenneth Shamblin is following the latest in Palmetto, Florida, just south of Tampa. Millions of gallons of wastewater for days have been released into Florida waterways, including Tampa Bay, to relieve stress on the pond's retaining walls in a desperate effort remote, to avoid an environmental disaster. What we're looking at now this link here in the is plan for the week trying the to prevent and respond to, if need be, a real catastrophic flood situation. Officials say the pond in an old fertilizer manufacturing plant holds 480 million gallons of polluted water, a mix of salt water, storm runoff, and acidic water containing phosphorus and nitrogen. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis denied reports it's radioactive. The water meets water quality stand standards for marine waters, uh, with the exception primarily of, of the phosphorus and the nitrogen. The Piney Point Phosphate Plant closed 20 years ago. There's been growing concern about both the water and the deteriorating infrastructure holding it. A top state regulator called it one of the biggest environmental threats in Florida history in a 2003 story in the St. Petersburg Times. The paper reporting state officials fear the waste will spill into Tampa Bay, killing millions of fish and destroying plant life for miles. Even without flooding, the controlled flow is pumping potentially dangerous water into the bay. Ed Sherwood, who runs a local estuary program, is worried about the impact. For the past 20 years, we've been uh, trying to get attention to final closure for this facility. I think this just raises the bar. Sherwood says the nitrogen and phosphorus concentrations could fuel more algae blooms, which can kill off fish and other wildlife. The people that work and live in Tampa Bay have, have done a lot and made a lot of investments to get the bay back in a healthy condition as we see it today. It wasn't always like this. So when these events happen, it's almost an insult to that community. Authorities say they will work to close this plant permanently. The bigger issue they say is that there are dozens of similar plants, crumbling aging infrastructure all over the state. Janet Shemley in CBS News, Palmetto, Florida. All right, for more on this, let's bring in Tina Nguyen. She's a reporter covering this story with our Tampa Bay station, WTSP, and she's joining us now from Palmetto, Florida. So explain to our viewers what the latest on efforts to prevent a breach of the reservoir. Um, is there still a severe flood threat in the area? So right now there is a flood threat in the area as long as there is water in that reservoir. So crews are bringing in extra pumps. The Florida Division of Emergency Management is bringing in 20 extra pumps, 10 vacuum trucks, and they're trying to get as much of that water out as possible. They started with about 480 million gallons. They're now down to about 330 million gallons. So they're pumping that water out to relieve pressure on that leak so that it hopefully does not burst. Evacuations were expanded near the reservoir over the weekend. Uh, what can you tell us about this? Is there any clear indication of when people can return home actually? Yeah, so it expanded over the weekend to more than 300 homes, about 316 within that evacuation area. And they're not going to be able to get back into that area until the threat of that burst is actually clear. So until they get all of this water out. So officials are estimating anywhere from four to 10 days before people can get back in there. 
So Tweet, how did the situation at this reservoir escalate to the point of evacuations and potential catastrophic flooding? What happened? So at first they noticed a leak in the lining of this reservoir. So the lining is like a shallow pool liner. It's thick plastic and they noticed a leak in there. So they tried to repair it. But once they figured out they couldn't repair it and it just got a little bit bigger, that's when that threat came in and they had to make sure that people got out in time for those evacuations just to cover all the bases and make sure everyone is safe. So now they're no longer going to try and repair that liner. They're just going to empty out that reservoir to eliminate the possibility of that burst of the reservoir. Uh, yeah, well, there's a couple different things they're doing. So here, here's the basic plan. Like, uh, if this is like ground level and then all right, so let's say this is like sea level, like this, and then this is ground level. So this part of Florida is like really low, you know, like you gotta go miles inland before you're even 10 feet above sea level. It's really close to sea level. So how the ponds are built is you actually excavate this soil and use that soil to build, you know, the berm like around the outside of it. So then what you end up with, what you're looking at there is the edge of the pond. This part here has been excavated so then what you do is then you, because it's just soil, it's very permeable to water, you put a liner. So like you saw that rubber, the black rubber liner, so it's just like a pool liner. This rubber liner is 42 years old. And you know, rubber doesn't last forever. You know what I mean? It, it degrades. So the whole thing is lined with plastic. And then the deal is that fertilizer plant, which they showed is down like, you know, near the ocean itself. So how, what you actually do is you take salt, you take seawater, and then you uh, concentrate phosphates and nitrates from the seawater into manufacture fertilizer. But you have a lot of waste product in manufacturing fertilizer and it's not safe to dump it in the ocean. So what these companies did is they're like, well, if we can't dump it in the ocean, we just got to store it somewhere. And so they've just basically stored it in these ponds kind of forever, you know, until you can figure out what to do with it. But the company went out of business 20 years ago. So basically, this pond has been the responsibility of the state of Florida. And uh, it said 480 million gallons. That's a lot of water. And the problem is, whenever the pond gets a leak or the liner gets a leak, that water begins to seep through. But as it seeps through, it erodes the soil. And as the soil erodes, the hole gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the risk is that you can have a catastrophic failure, that this earthen dam just rips open and all that water all gushes out at once. So they're like, well, what happens if 480 million gallons of water dumps out on that side? Well, there's all these houses and stuff here. So 300 people's houses, they're like, you gotta go. When can I come back? I'm like, oh, I don't know. And they said to alleviate the pressure, and this is actually kind of sad because all this water is nasty stuff. It does not belong in the bay, but to prevent a breach of the dam and the whole thing just bursting and taking out people's houses and killing people, they've just been pumping water, you know, into the, into the bay. And they've lowered the water level quite a bit. They lowered it, you know, to about that height. So what they're working on now is dilution. So the water you saw them pumping in is now like, you know, fresher water being pumped in so that the water that's being that's draining out is a little bit more dilute. There's, it's a misnomer, like it's kind of a, it's a bad saying, but it's kind of an okay saying. Uh, it's actually a terrible saying. Dilution is the solution to pollution. That's actually a horrible idea, but it goes to dilute something means to make it like less concentrated. So if you take, you know, a little bit of phosphate and you dump it in the entire ocean, it gets diluted. So in total, it doesn't cause that much damage. But when you put a whole bunch of that waste into a shallow bay that's enclosed, it can have, you know, immediate negative consequences. So they said in the story about having high nitrates and high phosphates causing an algae bloom. It also causes the oxygen, con oxygen concentration to drop down so that like the fish that are living in 
you know, the fish can immediately die. You get algae blooms, so the water like turns green in the bay. Um, and this isn't the only, you know, waste site. They're all over Florida. Yeah, you don't want it. Like you want the nitrates and phosphates to be low, especially on coral reefs, it's near zero. Um, so the whole plan about concentrating the nitrates and phosphates and leaving them in these ponds is that you kind of like, just kind of keep it there forever. But forever can't be forever, right? You gotta like, at some point deal with the issue. That's not the only pond. So here even in that, uh, it's this large one that's the issue. Yeah, like this is the one that failed. This one's still okay. But um, all throughout Florida, you see all these like things like this. There's a bunch of different reasons why these lakes exist. They're not natural. Like nature doesn't make rectangular lakes. Sometimes you excavate soil out of here to be able to build up soil to put a house on or just literally building roads. You need the material to build roads. So oftentimes in Florida, the place where you get the soil and the rock from is from, uh, from you know, excavations. Uh, here, here's a good example. This is a very, very, very typical thing you see along the Florida coast. These are all like, uh, I mean, these could all be people like over 70 years old. You know, they go down to retire, they wanna live on the, on the ocean and stuff. There's all these little developments and communities and see there's these roads that go up with these roads that go in and then in between the houses there's these canals so the canals are a place where people can have like a house almost all these houses have pools so these these things here and here and here those aren't solar panels those are like enclosed pools like they're outdoor pools but they have like the screen around them and then people have uh, boats in their backyard and you can get out to the ocean because you can like take that waterway, go down out to here, and now you're out on the ocean. But in order to build the houses, you need soil. You need to build the land up a little bit. And where that land comes from is these canals. So you dig out the canals, build up the land, put your houses on them. Now you conveniently have canals. Uh, but you can also use those, use that material to build up, uh, build up structures. So here's a, like, here's another one. Uh, this is actually a golf course and home site. So do you see how like these are individual? So people who live here, um, I mean, these are like cookie cutter houses, right? They're like all the same. This might be a golf course community. You know, there's a, uh, yeah, it doesn't have it. Yeah, so how it is is like, uh, this is actually, these are actually real roads with real cars. But see, these houses are all pretty much alike. And then everybody has a golf course in their backyard. So like, uh, maybe you live in this house and you're like, okay, I'm going to go play around. And maybe this is the fifth hole. So you start on the fifth hole and play around, you know, so you play five to 18 and then one to four. And when you get done, you played your round of golf and you're right back at your house, right? And you can do that every day of your life if you want, because is that what you're talking about? You know, live that life. Then uh, actually, if you do it right, you can probably have a boat in your backyard and a golf course in your front yard. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Right there. Uh, yeah, just like this. Right oh, yeah. That guy is, wait, is that a house right there to the left of the, the canal? Over here? This? Yeah. Uh, probably not. It's uh, maybe like, I don't know what that is. It's not a house. Yeah, see, like, uh, that guy's right there. yeah, this is a big crib here, right? Yeah, big yeah. crib, pool in the backyard. You got your boat in the bay. And then a uh, golf course right here. See? And th there's no Google Street View because this is like a gated community. You know, you can't live in that boomer life, right? So here's another one. But see, these people don't have access to, they don't have access to the ocean. So these are like ponds. 
these kind of all, all alligators in them. You know, there's alligators in every one of these. So you go to walk your dog, and the alligator gets them. <laughs> like all this, you know, all these people. See, look at all this stuff down here. And this is all, uh, you know, all houses and golf courses, just one after the other. Lakewood Ranch Golf and Country Club. So you're not used to seeing like houses on golf courses, but that's the way they do down there, you know, so. Oh yeah, because they like the fresh water. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, like if it's inland, the manatee can't get to it, but if it's like one that has ocean access, yeah. yeah. So the manatee, like they, they, they're mammals, they have to drink fresh water. So they'll swim up rivers to get fresh water. But yeah, they'll get, they'll go right out of hoses. People do it on boats too. Like people have fresh water on their boat and then they'll just pour the water over the boat and the manatees. And they, manatees aren't the smartest animals in the world, but they'll learn that, you know, water coming into the water, which is not natural. They'll learn, oh, that's some human with a hose. I'm gonna get me a drink. Like it's delicious fresh water. So yeah, you can live that boomer life if you want. Uh, this very typical around Tampa. All this. Here's more. So like, yeah, you take your boat, you go right up through here. See how far inland you can go? You can go in like, there's like 10 city blocks distance. You live right by the Home Depot. And so boating is pretty popular. People also like get around by golf carts. Like some of the communities, um, you can use golf carts on the roads and stuff. So, all right, so that's that. Uh, this is, I'll put this link on the, let's see. I'll put this link on the page too, but this is a pretty good overview. Uh, this is from, USA Today describing how, like the location of the breach and then uh, the original the original uh, plant, the cooling pond, evaporation ponds, and these reservoirs are where the waste is built up and the location of the breach, which is down toward the bottom. The uh, thing about earthen dams and the breaches with earth, earthen dams that are no joke, I'll show you a video of like how it goes. So you can build dams a couple different ways. Typically dams are, uh, are what are called earthen dams. And what it means to be an earthen dam or an earth dam is just simply that you have uh, a dam that's built out of compressed soil. That's the way our levee, the levee that runs around the river, it's an earthen levee. And what's critical about the levee is that you you can have water fill to the top. So here, if you, we're gonna watch this for just a little bit, get to the top. So it's natural for the dam itself to be saturated with water. And the water that saturates the dam usually leaks through the dam a little bit. And it's okay for the dam to be wet and for it to leak through. So it's, it's pretty natural for dams to be, you know, uh, completely saturated with water, but if you get a hole through the dam or if the dam is breached by running water over the top, it can cause catastrophic failure. So here they're gonna intentionally, here, watch this real quick. The water runs across the top of the dam. And as soon as the water breaches the top of the dam, it begins to run across the dam and it makes like a little channel and it begins to erode the top of the dam. So it's, this is the, the Johnstown flood is very famous as a terrible disaster where an earthen dam was overtopped by running water. So the water's still running and now the water's gonna go across the top. And pretty much as soon as the water crosses the top of the dam, it begins to erode the dam immediately and the dam will fail catastrophically like that. So as long as the water doesn't get to the top, it'll sit like that forever, you know, a decade, a hundred years. The moment water starts to go over the top, 
it begins to erode the top down and it reduces the weight down on the top of the dam and the whole thing will fail. Yeah. Does that apply to all the dam on Not to concrete. No, but concrete dams still have spillways. Uh, but see, yeah, like the levee that runs around Williamsport that protects us from flood, it's easy to build an earthen dam. If you were to want to have a concrete wall the whole way, it's incredibly expensive. It requires a huge amount of material. It's just, it's prohibitively expensive. So, um, well, we have, like, what's that one big giant concrete dam? It's like, isn't it above like a city? Yeah, the Hoover Dam. Well, the Hoover Dam is famous, but the thing about the Hoover Dam is it also has a spillway. Uh, let me see. Yeah, because it's Arizona and Nevada. Okay, so on this side. Yeah, it's not so easy to see here. But the dam's actually, the water level in the dam's very low. So you never want the water to go over the top of the dam. So what's a little bit lower than the top of the dam is this other spillway. This thing here is the spillway. And the spillway is a device that's designed to let water go over the top of it. It's actually a curved concrete structure that's reinforced at the top. The water can go over the spillway into this ditch and down through that hole. There was a famous, let me see, the, what's the name of the f dam? Uh, uh, not that one the Oroville Dam. So just four years ago, there's a dam called the Oroville Dam in California. And it is an earthen dam that has an emergency spillway. So this is the reservoir at the top. And you see just how tall this dam is. It's, it's incredible. And it had massive amounts of rainfall. And the rainfall rate was so high that although this emergency spillway or this is the main spillway where the water runs down. They had so much water running down the spillway that the concrete here cracked and the concrete cracked and broke. So you see how this curved structure, it should continue down nice. This is the rest of the concrete. The concrete broke here and now the water is breaking into the earthen part of the dam. And the problem is this erosion happened really, really, really fast. At the same time, this is the emergency spillway over here, which I don't think water ever went over water began going over the emergency spillway. So the emergency spillway has a curved concrete structure at the top, but then right after that, it's just soil. And the thing is those emergency spillways are only designed for like a little bit of water for a little bit of time, but it was like days and days and days and days. And the issue is that as the water flows over the concrete structure and it begins to erode the soil here, it can undermine the concrete structure and cause the concrete structure to like fall down. And now you don't have concrete at the very top, you have just dirt at the very top. And this is near Davis, California. I don't know why that happened. Wait, and that? Davis, California. Uh, so that's not, it's, wait, so it won't be that way all year round, will it? No, usually there's not a whole lot of, uh, yeah, so here is the, this is what the spillway should look like, nice and smooth and whatnot. But when they had the damage in the spillway, this is after the, this is after the water had been let out. You can see the breach in that. And, uh, you know, that hole in the spillway then causes all this erosion to take place below it. This is during the disaster. So they evacuated a couple towns. It was, uh, I want to say 50,000 people had to be evacuated. And it was for days on end. Let's see. I think I'd go back to the town while everybody's evacuated and start looting. Well, yeah, that kind of stuff happens. People do that like during evacuations for fires, evacuations for hurricanes. I hate to I say, know, imagine that. just like everybody in the water just like gone. And then imagine like just like driving downtown and just like. You know, it, well, our levee protects a large part of the city. And if we had an imminent failure of the levee, the city would be ordered to evacuate. 
and all you got to do is get uphill. So basically, if you go up, like Grampian Hills would never flood. You know, that's that's yeah. like too high. So you only have to go. If you're in the city, you only have to go two miles and you're good. You just go up the hill. You know, go up Blooming Grove Road or go up, you know, whatever. You just have to get above where the water would be. But if we had an imminent chance of a flood, like of the levee breaking, you'd be ordered to leave. You don't want to be in it. You can get killed. And the problem is, is when you make that evacuation order, yeah, people have the opportunity to like loot. So part of the issue with evacuating for hurricanes, flooding, fires, is people will say, I'm not leaving either because they don't think the threat is real because they're just like, I don't know, dumb. You see it all the time. People are like, I'm not leaving. I've ridden, I've rode out hurricanes before. I'm not leaving for this one. And then their house gets ruined and everything's gone. And they were like, boy, I wish I would have got out because every hurricane is different, right? And they're like, well, we had wildfires before. My house didn't burn down. Well, what if this one's the one that does? Now you're stuck and now you die. But people also will stay behind to like, it's my house and I'm protecting my property. But what's more important, you know, your life or like your stuff? So, I mean, you have insurance, hopefully. Like if you got homeowner's insurance and you evacuate because of a flood and somebody loots your place. His house is right on the beach, like five steps out of his backyard. Yeah. It's just crazy. Like, he's on his surfboard in the water. Like, he's crazy. He like, gets lightning and storm and hurricanes. So, people who have older homes that are low lying, that are just wood frame homes, in a hurricane, you know, a hurricane can take it right out. But there are homes that are built on stilts and, you know, are solid concrete construction with metal roofs that are specifically designed so that they can ride out any hurricane. They're like hurricane proof homes and people will choose to stay behind. Uh, so like, I don't know. Okay, so here's a for instance, this home See, open image, new tab. So this is a, for instance, this home here was built to the standards required to withstand a hurricane. So how it goes is the entire house is built on stilts. The opening, the bottom is completely open. It's designed so that the waves and the wind can rush through it. Those stilts aren't just like four by four wood. They're usually steel pillars and they're embedded into concrete. And then the entire structure of the home is going to be concrete block or steel panels with a steel roof. So you see all these other houses and all these other buildings are gone. Even, you know, even three blocks in, this is all gone up in here. Yeah. This house looks like it's kind of okay. This one's got to damage the roof, but this house here is clearly built. I mean, it stood as a hurricane took down that neighborhood and, uh, you know, if the if the storm surge wasn't so like this might be 10 feet up and if the storm surge wasn't 10 feet tall, the inside of your house is perfectly OK. But what people will do in these homes, too, is because the storm surge could be higher and get into this floor, they'll just take their valuables, move it from this floor up to the top floor. And, uh, you know, if this floods, then you just go in with a pressure washer, clean it out. and You're good. You just, you know, you don't put carpet in. Yeah. You might. Yeah, and what's unusual is a lot of times these houses, the kitchens are on the upper level, which might seem kind of dumb, but it makes sense. All your appliances up and out. that's right. So this is like the living level, you know, like in a bedroom. It, it what's easier to move, a couple mattresses or like a refrigerator and a freezer and you know a stove, and you have to disconnect that stuff and haul it upstairs. So this is usually the living level, and then the upper level sometimes be like you know kitchen, bathroom, the kind of stuff where it's far more expensive to repair, replace, and move things. But the difference is this house may have cost, you know, three times as much money to build 
is one beside it. But the other difference is whoever owned this house that was right here, because there was a house right here, doesn't have a house. there's no house. And their homeowner's insurance was way more money because, you know, now the homeowner's insurance is the homeowner's insurance company is going to have to pay to rebuild the house. That's a lot of money. This house here, your annual premium is very small. You know, you, you call, first off, you call your homeowner's insurance company and you're like, hey, I want to insure a house. It's right on the coast in Florida, on the east coast of Florida. And there's a whole lot of questions they're going to ask. They're like, is it on grade? Is it, or is it elevated? And then, you know, what's the construction? What standards was it built to? So you may pay three times as much a year in insurance for the place that was here as the place was here. This is the actual beach. Like you can see, this is, this is sand. This is, you know, you might walk out and they own the beach getting right down to the water. So there would have been, uh, this is a slab for a slab built home. There was, there was another house here. All that stuff is gone. That all the contents and material for this home is either out in the ocean or it's back up in here. It's all gone. It's just wiped clean. Um, yeah, so, you know, we know enough about the damage that can be done and about ways in which you can build stuff. These are other ones that are, you know, elevated homes. It was like it was kind of circular like that and it was built on wood stilts but it was like huge but it was on the east coast and it was like wood stilts and i was like only thinking to make the flooding to surface and not not hurricanes because we don't really get a lot of this out yeah see when we say the storm surge the ocean could literally come up you know right up to the bottom there you could have 10 20 feet of the ocean coming up and then you got a, also 120 mile an hour winds so you want a shape that's relatively aerodynamic. Flat surfaces have a lot of, we say, sail area. The wind pushes very hard against them. This round and round structures are very strong structures. So this is inherently a very, a very strong structure. But you got to, you know, you got to walk up the stairs to get in your place all the time. Yeah. Sometimes the bottoms of these will be enclosed, like as a garage, but those enclosure walls are intentionally built to be weak. You know, like. They're plywood walls, but um, they may just be screwed in just four places. That way, when the flood and the waves come in, it rips the wood off the outside intentionally. But you've already evacuated, so your car is not there anymore. You know. Yeah, and see, then then you know your place is good. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah. You're like, we're going to build it. And that's where he does for a living, too. He does concrete stuff. And then it's going to be done, and you're good. And your insurance is going to be cheap. Because yeah. otherwise, if you build it, you know, real low, where it floods all the time, it's way too much money. Even people around, you know, sometimes people around here, uh, there was a, there's a neighborhood in Lock Haven before they built the levee there where they raised the whole neighborhood up. So they were like all ranch houses. And then uh, you, you can, you know, detach them from the from the foundation. You lift the whole house up in one shot, put it on pillars, and then they have parking underneath. But um, that was done because those houses got flooded regularly, and the insurance companies like, listen, you know, every time you guys get flooded, we got to come through and replace all the insulation, all the drywall, all the carpet, replace all your contents. Every time it floods, you know, we're dropping 50,000, 100,000 bucks fixing your place up. And we're doing that every couple of years. So how about this instead? We're just going to pay to lift your house up and you're going to live 10 feet above the ground. But then at the same time, we're only going to charge you a third as much in homeowner's insurance. Your homeowner's insurance is going to go way down. We're not going to charge you to lift the house up. We're just going to do it for you. And now you're going to have a parking garage underneath your place. All right, so the uh, chapter five uh, review, I put a solution, like a whole solution guide in the folder for chapter five. So in, in chapter five, 
uh, in that folder right down toward the bottom, it says chapter five review solutions spring 2021. If you haven't finished the study guide or if you have some other ideas you need to get from that, uh, you need to look at that. One of the, some of the topics that are in there are about uh, the phosphate and nitrate pollution. Oh yeah, I said, didn't put them in there. But in the water chemistry lab, you tested the phosphate level and the nitrate level in the uh, in one of the aquariums, and those are the two main things that are used as fertilizers, but are main pollutants in ocean water and in uh, in our aquariums. Those are nutrients you don't want to have because they uh, it's dangerous to uh, most animals, but also encourages the growth of algae that you don't want to have in the water. Days today.